we'll be looking today at, this evening, at the characteristics of a committed Christian. And this is going to be found in 2 Timothy 4, uh, if you would turn there, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll be there shortly. Uh, as I was um, considering and praying about what the Lord would have uh, me to preach on tonight, um, it was pretty clear that the idea of commitment um, could be found from this passage, and uh, it's something that is very needed today, especially when we're talking about um, Christians. There's a lot of nominal Christians in the world, Christians that exist, uh, say, in, in name only, uh, around the world, especially in America. Uh, but what we really need in America today, in Michigan today, in Fostoria and the surrounding area are committed Christians. And the idea of commitment is found throughout much of the Bible. And uh, when we're talking about this, one uh, person that kept coming to my mind, and uh, I don't know, it's maybe the teacher in me, um, but people in history that have been very committed to something that was revolutionary. Um, from a spiritual standpoint, the early Christians especially, we can see that their commitment, what, what did the Pharisees say? It turned the world upside down. It literally shook to the very core the way that society operated in not only Judea, but even throughout the Roman Empire and thus throughout the rest of the world. The, the gospel has the power to still do that today. So we should have that same commitment. But when I think of people throughout history, one of the people that came to mind, just popped into my mind, was uh, the scientist from the 19th century, Louis Pasteur. And he was a French um, biologist and um, was committed to a couple things. The first thing he was very committed to was the idea that disease um, originated from actual microorganisms, things that were uh, not able to be seen with the, the, the naked eye. You actually had to use a newfangled device known as a microscope to even see them. But he knew they were there, and he had been studying them, and he knew that they actually caused disease, and that in order to fight those diseases, you had to actually eradicate that microorganism. And one of the ways that he did that, uh, he was very early in the science of it, but uh, was through vaccination and various methods that were very new technology to that day. But the other aspect that he came up against was something that for us as Christians is very important, and that was the idea of spontaneous generation. He directly combated that idea, and he was actually very committed to the fight against the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution actually began with Charles Darwin during Louis Pasteur's lifetime. In fact, as he began his career, uh, that was something that he came up directly against. And spontaneous generation is the idea that life can spontaneously, or at, a, at any given moment, generate. You know, it just comes into existence. That's what spontaneous generation means. And spontaneous generation had actually existed in some form since the time of the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks even believed in some form of spontaneous generation. But it had actually grown in significance during the Middle Ages, when there was a lot of superstition involved. But even in Pasteur's day, there were renowned scientists. The main school of thought in Pasteur's day was that you could have a flask of broth that would sit out for a few days, maybe a week, and then next thing you know, there's, there's bacteria in the broth. Well, where did they come from? Well, they just sprang into existence. Spontaneous generation. But Pasteur painstakingly pointed out through a series of flasks that were completely sterile, that spontaneous generation could not happen if you had a flask that had a little crooked 
neck on it. And that would keep dust particles from falling into the flask. And on those dust particles, there were microorganisms like bacteria that could then start populating. And Pasteur was very committed to this reality, this, this scientific fact. But he was actually ridiculed in his day. He was treated as a, a nut in his day. And he had many other things that he revolutionized science with. Of course, pasteurization and different things bear his name. Um, but just to kind of start out tonight, when we think of commitment and the commitment that we need to have as a Christian, one of the things that I think we should look to is a man who, even though he did believe in God, and he was a, a, actually a very devout man in the Roman Catholic religion of France in that day, he was committed and he demonstrates to us that even though it's not popular, even though the ideas might seem out of uh, touch, as a Christian, we need to be very committed to the truth. And tonight we're going to look at four characteristics. We're going to start in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to look at what these characteristics are. Let's just read verses 1 and 2 together to start with. So in verse 1 it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. The first thing we see is uh, that a Christian who is committed is one who proclaims. And that comes from verse 2, where it says, We need to preach the word. Now, I understand that this context of this passage is delivered from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, his son in the faith, that he was preparing for a preaching ministry of the gospel. I, I fully recognize that. And obviously, we're not all pastors here. We're not all ministers, per se. But we are all, I believe, Christians. We're all child, uh, children of God. And as such, this passage still bears relevance to us because all Christians should proclaim the word of God. Yes, you might not have a preaching ministry of the gospel that you are integrally involved in, that you've been called to, but you nonetheless need to be involved in proclaiming the gospel. Proclaiming the gospel is something that Christians have been called to do in a variety of ways, but let's look first at what we are to proclaim. What, what are we to proclaim? Well, we're to proclaim the word the word that we have been given, the very Bible itself. Again, in verse 1, Paul says that he charges us before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. It's his word. It's the word of Jesus Christ. And the Bible itself, the very gospel of the kingdom, is meant to be proclaimed here. If we look in Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the word, the gospel, is to be proclaimed. It's not to be hindered. It's not to be held back. It's supposed to be proclaimed until the end. We all are still here because the end has not yet arrived. That means that the word is still meant to be proclaimed. It's still meant to be preached. It's meant to be distributed to all the nations as a witness. Also in Acts 20, it says that this is Paul's testimony of his own ministry here. Near the very end of his ministry, he says to the group of believers before he goes to Jerusalem, he says that he testified both to the Jews and the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we are to proclaim. We are to proclaim that same message. That message is to be one of, you need to repent of your sin. There needs to be a demonstration of what sin is. That this world is fallen. It's broken. It's in need of a Savior. And then, 
Who are they to turn to? Who are they to believe on? They're to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for them, the very Son of God. And that is to be presented and proclaimed faithfully throughout our lives and throughout the time that we've been given until the end comes. Also in Isaiah 61, verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I'm sure we're all familiar with the children's song, right? That goes with this very passage. The idea of Jesus being the one that can heal the brokenhearted. He can set the captive free. We're to proclaim that. That's to be our message. And one who is a committed Christian devotes his life or her life to proclaiming that message. It's meant to be proclaimed. It's meant to be delivered as much as possible. So that's what we are to proclaim. Well, how are we to proclaim it? How should we proclaim the gospel and the message that we've been given? Well, a committed Christian doesn't go out and decide that he's going, he or she is going to be obnoxious or they're going to try to uh, you know, proclaim it in a way that makes it offensive. Even though the gospel, to many, is offensive. The gospel should be proclaimed in a way that is tender and yet is clear and bold. And it is meant to be done so unceasingly. That is the example that we are given, not just from the life of the Apostle Paul, but of anyone who was given this message in Scripture. They devoted their life to it, and they did it in a way that was clear and concise, and it was spread throughout the whole world. And that's our goal. Where, do we, where are we to proclaim this message? Well, we're to proclaim it throughout the entire world. In Mark 16, 15, one of the passages of the Great, uh, Great Commission, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have been given a message that is not just for ourselves, that we keep to ourselves. It's meant to be spread. It's meant to be sent. It's meant to be given. And it's meant to be given often and freely. And that is the commitment of this church. And it's, it's a blessing to be part of a, of a gospel preaching ministry. Because as we'll see later on here, is that as believers lose their commitment, so does a church. And if a church loses its commitment, well, very shortly thereafter, it will end up leaving the path that it's been given in the Word of God. So our commitment, our personal commitment is very important. And the first thing that we saw here is that a committed Christian is one who proclaims the word of God. But secondly, a committed Christian, number two, is one who practices. Is one who practices. What is being practiced? Well, it's the very beliefs and um, teachings and doctrines of Scripture. Let's go back to verse 2. And notice the phrase where it says, be instant, in season, out of season. The idea here of being instant is that it's an actual practice that I'm living out. A lot of Christians, so-called, are what I said at the beginning, nominal Christians, meaning that they, they would claim they're a Christian. If you were to ask them what faith they have, what do they believe, they might tell you emphatically, I'm a Christian. There might be a popular uh, media personality or a sports figure or uh, an actor or an actress, and they'll say, I'm a Christian. But we know from Scripture, studying the Word of God in even the most minute way, that a person who claims to be a Christian will very quickly be found out if they are or if they are not based on how they practice it, based on how they live based on the Word of God. So a believer, a committed Christian, will practice their faith, and notice what it says, instant, in season, out of season. We know that there are seasons in this uh, climate that we live in, in this region of the world. We have very four distinct seasons. But in some parts of the world, they only have two. 
They have a wet season and they have a dry season, basically. Lots of rain, no rain. And Paul is living in the Mediterranean region where that's true. They have a wet season and they have a dry season. And in that wet season, that's when things are a lot more tolerable, right? It's cooler. It's easier to get out and go and do what you want to do. And the dry season was also winter. It's actually, they didn't get rain, but it was also colder. It was a lot more harsh weather, especially in that time period. So it was a lot more difficult for people to even live. But Paul's saying a Christian should be different. A Christian is a Christian year-round. And I would ask you and I, are we Christians year-round? Day by day, week by week, month by month. Because a truly committed Christian is one that practices their faith, they live it out, and they're consistent with it. They don't fall off of it, they don't come in and out. You see them one week and then they're gone for like 20 more weeks and you don't know where they are. That is can be very typical in, in many modern churches today. It's, it's almost expected. And we'll discuss more on that later, but for yourself individually, are you faithful? Are you instant, in season, out of season? Because that is a mark of your commitment. And it is meant to be something that we adhere to not just the pastor, even though this is a passage that does deal with the preaching ministry, you know, pastors aren't the only ones that are supposed to be here every service. It's meant to be for the whole church. It's meant to be for everyone that claims the name of Christ. If the doors are open, as God provides, I will be there mentality. That's what needs to be abundant. And it's not just church attendance either. It's how we live out our daily walk, our time spent in the Word of God and in prayer. Is that commitment real? And are we faithful to it? So we have here the idea of being in season and and out of season faithful. Um, Next, we're going to look at the commitment. The committed Christian is one who protects. One who protects. And this is found in the next uh, uh, part of verse 2. It says, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This part of the verse deals with the idea that a committed Christian is one who does not put up with error, does not put up with and allow things that are false and things that are contrary to the word of God into his own life or into the lives of others that are part of his spiritual family. And there are three methods that are given to us here. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort that are to be employed, again, not just by those that are in pastoral leadership of the church, but individual Christians as well. The idea of reproving carries with it the idea of actually confronting error. It's the idea where uh, men or women get involved in, in things that are contrary to the word of God. Not just you know heresies or things that are undoctrinal, but it could even be with their lifestyle. It could be with what they're allowing in their own personal lives that goes contrary to the very word of God. And to reprove that is to go and make, literally the idea is argument, and we'll discuss what that means in a minute here, but it's to go to them and tell them, no, 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 that's wrong. And reproving or arguing, obviously in the worldly sense, is very destructive. It carries with it a, a very negative connotation. And that's understandable. Uh, We actually live in a time period where people can be very confrontational about the most minute things, right? Like passing someone on the road or, or something like that. They can be very confrontational about very small matters. But yet there are other times where, especially when it comes to spiritual things, we turn a blind eye 
to things that the Bible says are important, and we pretend like, oh, I don't need to say anything about that. that they'll figure it out on their own, or it's not that big of a deal. And we become very unconfrontational, non-confrontational about things that the Word of God says explicitly are important. And the reality is there needs to be a balance, like in anything else. But a Christian, a committed Christian, will find, again, being spirit-led, that he or she must reprove error when it arises. It should always start in one's personal life. But as we look and, and are concerned about others around us who claim the name of Christ especially, are we, in a, again, a prayerful way, involved in the ministry of repro reproving and rebuking and exhorting when it becomes necessary? Rebuking, of course, is to actually make that confrontation. It's to come before them. Hopefully, again, in a prayerful way, in a way that is done many times privately, in a way that is done lovingly, not to be done uh, you know, hastily and in a way that would cause genuine um, offense, but in a way that is to be done carefully and kindly. And the one that I think is often overlooked is the idea of exhorting. The third method here, the idea of exhorting, is actually to be more so an encourager. Many times the rebuke and the reproof comes, but very more often than not, the lacking element of that is exhorting. Ex exhortation or to exhort someone is to actually encourage them. It's to build them up. It's to challenge them to do what is right. And it doesn't just take place normally one time. In fact, all of these, if you notice, one of the elements with all of them is long-suffering, meaning that we're very patient. There may need to be multiple times that this occurs. And I think exhortation especially is an element that we often fall off of. We, we forget many times to encourage and exhort and constantly be there to challenge our brothers and sisters in Christ to see them improve and for them to remember that they're not forgotten about, to remember that they are cared for, that they are important to us in the gospel ministry. Some biblical examples of these would be men in the Bible like uh, James and John. They are called the sons of thunder and, and others, but they are considered to be some of the best encouragers amongst the group of the twelve. They were always there ready to uh, help in whatever way possible. They were high energy, you know, and they also were good exhorters. They could help and benefit in that way. And chances are, some of us might be a lot better at reproving <laughs> or rebuking. But have we worked on exhorting? Have we become the kind of people that are demonstrated in this passage? Another that I meant to mention was Barnabas. Barnabas is actually referred to as the son of consolation. That's where the idea of exhorting comes in. He was there not only to comfort, but encourage. And many believe that if Barnabas had not been there at the time that Paul was converted, he may not have been as effective in his own gospel ministry starting out if Barnabas hadn't had been as committed to the, the ministry of exhortation. So the challenge for us is, are we meant to be a Barnabas for someone? Are we meant to be a James or John for someone that could be greatly used, far more greatly used of God in his ministry if we were to exhort the way we should. Again, with long-suffering and doctrine, those are very essential elements of all of these. Patience, but also the truth. The actual truth of the Word of God must be the root of any of these things that we embark in. So as we seek to protect the things that God says doctrinally are important in the local church, 
in our own lives spiritually, may we not forget to be long-suffering and to be firmly rooted in the truth. Those are absolutely essential. If we're going to be effective Christians, if we're going to be truly committed to what God has for us here in this time we have left, we must make sure that those are elements of what we are practicing. But why is protection so important? I, I'm going to spend a little bit longer on this point because the passage does too. And the reasons why this element is so necessary in our day and throughout all of this church age is because there is verses 3 and 4. And we need to look at what happens there in verses 3 and 4 and why the protection of the truth is so important. Notice in verse 3 it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So the reasons why the protection is so necessary is because error emerges in this world all too easily. And throughout church history, going back to the early church itself, right off the bat, as the Great Commission starts to go out, churches begin to be established as believers are gathered together the Apostle Paul and all of the other early church leaders had to directly confront error right away. Uh, some of the most significant elements of error still exist today, currently, and some are growing in prominence. But this passage, interestingly, mentions in that beginning phrase, for there will come a time. For the time will come, sorry. For the time will come. It indicates that there's an actual period of time. There's an actual destination in time where mankind, especially those that claim to believe the Bible, won't actually be able to endure the truth found in the Bible. And because they can't, they're actually going to seek out people who will tell them a lie, really, the false elements of what many in this world believe. And the reason why is because they, the idea of having itching ears is that they want someone to satisfy what they want to hear. It's as though their ears have an itch that they need somebody to scratch. They need somebody to satisfy it. And that will happen all too easily in this time period. And so it's interesting that in this uh, context, again, I identifying the idea of being a committed Christian, one who wants to protect the truth. Are we involved in that process by, first of all, understanding and confronting the error and understanding and confronting the lack of desire for truth? And this is going to happen more and more because we're living in a time period where this is true. We're living in a time period where people are leaving the truth. In fact, entire churches are leaving the truth and they are pursuing things that are essentially fables, falsehoods, things that are not biblical. And we need to be very aware of it. There's a, a recent book that is coming out talking about some of these ideas. There's a uh, been a lot of statistics that have come out recently, especially post-COVID. And we've talked with people at the fair this past summer and so forth, and just a lot of people are leaving church. They're not going to church anymore. They're just giving up on it. The book itself is actually called The Great De-Churching, which I thought was a really weird name. But it's the idea that People are leaving church, they're done with it, or they're going to another area of what they might call truth. And this book tries to explore what the reasons for that might be and how to get them back. And the main thing that the book found 
was that people just weren't interested anymore. They did not actually believe what they were hearing, and they didn't really want to be exposed to it anymore. They, it's as though society, in America especially, is just getting bored with the idea of being a Christian. And we should be able to realize why this is happening. Society in America, in this world, is becoming more and more godless. They're actually leaving it behind. They don't want to hear the truth in many cases, as this says. They, they want to leave off the truth. They want to abandon maybe even the foundations of principles that we have in the past. And they want to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And so for, for a committed Christian, if we're going to protect the truth, if we're going to stay where God wants us to be, we need to look at this and understand that I have a role in this. And my role in this is that when I confront others, as we said earlier, when I talk to them, when I proclaim the message that I am commanded to do, I need to do it with compassion, with patience, and I need to do it with sound doctrine. Yes, there are going to be more people that want to turn their ears to it. They want to, they want to plug their ears to it. They don't necessarily want the truth. But God is faithful. He will give us the fruit that he desires. And as long as we are committed and we are faithful and we strive to protect the truth, we will see victory. See, the, the other message of that book is that they want to use methods to get people back into the church that are not biblical. And that's very pro uh, predominant today. Yes, they recognize that, wow, we've got a problem. A lot of people have left church. A lot of Americans don't want anything to do with church anymore. But the answers to that is not to give them more of what they want, to scratch those itching ears, the answer is to give them the truth. The answer is to give them what the Word of God says. And we need to be diligent and committed to proclaim it and to practice it and protect it. And the final and fourth point is we need to be willing to persevere in it. Because the reality is, as we try to protect it, it's going to look like more and more of the world is abandoning the truth. They don't want anything to do with it. And that's understandable. Because the Bible tells us that this world is passing away. This world and its lusts are passing away. It's literally dying on the vine. Spiritually, it already is dead. But everything is collapsing and crumbling around the edges. The foundation is giving way. But that's the world. The truth still remains. The truth is still there. The foundation for us, if it's the word of God, it's still secure. Christ's parable about the, the unwise man who built his foundation on the sand and the man who built his house on the rock of the word of God, it's, it still holds true today. The world's trying to fill in the sand. They're trying to keep as much of a semblance as they can of what they want, but it's just slipping away. And you and I, if we will persevere on the foundation of the Word of God, we will have great reward and great success throughout not only this life here on the earth, but in the life which is to come. And let's look at what it says regarding this, the idea of persevering. Notice in verse 5, it says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Paul is giving his final exhortation to Timothy 
in this chapter. And in these three verses in particular, he summarizes the idea of not only his perseverance, but he's exhorting Timothy to do the same. And in that exhortation, he gives them basically three things. He says that he is to endure, sorry, he's to watch in all things. He's again to be committed and careful in making sure he understands not only what the Word of God says, but how he is living it out. He's also going to have to endure afflictions. And this is really where the idea of perseverance comes in. He's not only going to have to endure possibly physical ailments that can come about if we want to serve God and please Him, and that would include physical persecution. In that day especially, there was a persecution that was already beginning for the early church. Paul and many others were martyred in that early persecution. It's believed that within you know, a very short time of this epistle's completion that Paul was executed by Nero. So Paul understands that in this challenge he's giving to Timothy, you need to persevere. You need to endure affliction. It's not just physically, it's spiritually. There will be temptations. There always are temptations from the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we need to endure those. We need to watch and be careful. We need to do the work of an evangelist. Now granted, evangelism is a very particular ministry that God calls select individuals to. But you and I, again, going back to that first point, should still be part of the evangelism process. We should be part of the Great Commission. We should be proclaiming the truth. And that work must be done. And it's part of our perseverance, our commitment as a Christian. And with that, the final element is to make full proof of one's ministry. You know, when uh, we examine the lives of famous people, um, we often look at their most famous achievements, right? And we use those most famous achievements. Maybe it's a painter. We look at its most, his most famous painting or an author. We look at their most famous novel or whatever it is that they wrote. And we use that to typify the accomplishments that they had with their lives, the, the success that they had with their life. But Paul is not telling Timothy, hey, it's going to be all about the sermons you preach. You know, people are going to go to Timothy's top ten sermons, and that's going to be the full proof of his ministry. And even though there are many um, pastors that have gone on to be in heaven, and their sermons, even after they go to heaven, are very encouraging and uplifting, we don't look at that as full proof of ministry. The full proof of ministry that's being discussed here is, spiritually, what have you left behind? Are there believers, are there churches that are going to be impacted by your ministry? And after you are gone, will there have been lives that have been touched as a result? And I think this past year especially, I mean, we've had many believers go on to be with the Lord. And I think the funeral, the passing for Brother Dave Smith was such uh, an encouragement to see how many lives can be touched if we give our lives. We are committed to what God has for us to do. And it's not about how many people show up at your funeral, but just things like that can help attest and give us just a glimpse of what heaven will be like and the many rewards that we will receive to demonstrate that full proof of our ministry. And may that be the kind of commitment that we have. Paul most certainly was. He says, I'm ready. I've gotten to this point, and I know that at this point in my life, if I were to go home to be with the Lord today, I have accomplished everything that God has given me to do. My commitment is that secure. And so for us today, when we look at these exhortations that Paul's given us, the, the, this passage in, in the Word of God, are these characteristics true for us? 
if we were to look at our lives, can we say with the Apostle Paul, I'm ready. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And even though there might be other things, other goals that we have, other things that we believe the Lord would have us to do, are we, first of all, proclaiming like we should be? Are we practicing like we should be? Are we protecting like we should be? And are we persevering like we should be? If we're not, let us recommit to that today. And let us see the fruit of it in our lives as a result.